So um, first I want to thank you for the, the organizer for inviting me to speak here today. My name is Jelena Berglund, and in light of all discussion that we had today, I feel that I didn't make a slide, but I would like to say a few words about our office. Um, and I'm looking at Dr. Berg here because he really uh, voiced the need of having a regulatory group um, outside of IRB that will not be focused just on IRB applications, although we work closely with the IRB, but really regulatory group that will support investigators in different ways um, when it comes to communication with the FDA. So our group was is still mainly funded by CTSA grant, which is one of the NIH grants, and we got that. Uh, and our group was formed in 2009. And actually, Rob Kalov, who is now commissioner of FDA at that time, was PI at Duke. And he had that idea that academic institution should have a regulatory group that should be able to help investigators um, in their FDA communication and to be free of charge. So we are free of charge. And we so far worked with over 300 investigators. We did over 500 submissions. And yes, mainly they are drugs and biologics, although in the last few years, it's been a lot of devices. And um, as many of you mentioned today, we work on a lot of devices, but not a lot of them raised to the level that needs really an IDE and need to go to the FDA. So this is who we are. And somewhere through our slides, it will be linked to our website. We do work with investigators in other academic institutions. So I will encourage any of you who are having any kind of regulatory questions and you are academics and not company, feel free to contact us and um, we might be able to help free of charge. So since we came to the point of, so you determined the risk, you had a discussion with the IRB, or you knew up front that this would be significant risk study. So now we are at the point where actually you need to submit an IDE. And you also, this is not the first slide outlining the content of IDE today. Um, so you heard from many speakers of how, what were the main topics and how you should put IDE together. I really just try to, so this will be pretty like organizational type of presentation. What do you need to have and how you should be organized to send the application to the FDA? So um, the script itself is outlined in 21 CFR 312. So if you go to the FDA website, you will see exactly those sections which we try to follow. So um, we heard back from the FDA reviewer in, reviewers in different offices that they like to know where to find your documents. So they don't go through all like 700 pages in order to find risk assessment. So you should try to follow, if possible, these 14 outline sections if you're sending paper submission. It looks slightly different if you're doing electronic, obviously. And um, I will go through some of those sections today in more details or less. Um, and here is a list, link to our website that will take you to a lot of templates because through this slide, last eight, nine years of work, we really Okay, every application is different, and it will have a lot of specifics that you need to put in. So it's not really simple. You just open the template and start filling in. But in general, work is easier if you don't start from blank page, open Word document, new. So we created many templates, including templates for how to have pre-submission meeting based on the FDA guidance, which is great guidance, um, how to put IDE together, um, risk assessment templates, and these were some other device things, mainly drugs and biologics. So first thing that we go through is a cover sheet, uh, which is also known as Form 3514. We tend to sometimes use it, sometimes not. Different from our drug submissions that always have 1571, FDA has this Form 3514 that is actually not obligatory to use. So you don't have to use it if you don't want to. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. The reason for not using it is that beside ID information, it's a form that is used for 510K, PMA applications, <laughs> scheduling the meetings, reclassification requests, and stuff like that. So there will, you will see it's a five page long, and there are sections that you really don't necessarily need. Where we find it very useful is when we are scheduling pre-submission meeting, and then we want to outline different standards that we used for our um, testing. That's where we usually use this form, not necessarily for ID submission, but nothing wrong with using it, actually. I'm sure they might like it. Um, if you choose not to use it, um, please outline in your cover letter that this is an original submission. Otherwise, it could be amendment, report, or supplement. Which kind of device, what is the name of your device, and some basic information about your device. Name, intended use, so to give reviewer just heads up 
what, what is this application about? Who is the sponsor and manufacturer? Sometimes might not be the same uh, entity or same people. So you want contact information there. And if you had any previous discussion with the FDA, which we now strongly encourage our investigators to have, uh, so if you had the pre-submission meetings and uh, you have identified, therefore you have this pre-submission number, so that we would uh, like you or encourage you to put in your cover letter. So the reviewer will receive your application and will could, first of all, know what is, this is about, but also can go to the previous minutes and communications that had with the group and identify what, where, where, did you, where you are now with your device development. Um, second section is the name and address of the sponsor. That's self-explanatory. Uh, third would be a report of prior investigations. And it really could be a very lengthy section or could be quite short. Uh, we had it either way. Um, in a situations in which you have investigator that is using FDA approved device, so there is a label, Obviously, it's using it off-label because um, that's why you need an IDE. You might just refer to a label, and if someone was using it off-label similar to what you're going to be doing, you might want to list the previous publications, and other, or if there are some uh, bench studies that you did or animal studies you want to outline. But really, we had it sometimes as short as just refer to already have the approved label because we were using it in a very similar manner. But it was PMA device, so we needed IDE. Um, Sometimes, and this majority of cases, device in question is not FDA approved device. And this section then be, can be quite lengthy because then we are listing all bench studies that you did, um, were animal studies, were they done as a GLP or not, and if not, what were the exemptions of GLP requirements? If there are any clinical studies or preclinical, other preclinical studies or clinical studies that someone else did, then you would like to refer that to, this would all go in a section three. Um, section four is investigational plan, which is actually quite lengthy and has a couple of subsections here. One is first purpose, name, and intended use. And the purpose of your study, what is the name of your device and intended use. Clinical protocol goes in this section. Risk analysis is something that we have quite lengthy discussion with investigators about. There is a great guidance from the FDA how to make proper risk analysis. Because quite often, risk analysis investigators take from protocol saying uh, risk associated with these devices, internal bleeding, let's say, which is true, and uh, could be, um, it is true and should be mentioned. But general risk analysis is something that at least got, we got as a feedback from the FDA that they see it as a very important, and I'm looking forward for uh, FDA people here in the room commenting, do they feel that way? But the if you look at the guidance itself, and that we have template as well, Guidance is itself provided you with a quite nice um, description of how you should do risk analysis. And you should start that risk analysis as soon as possible. And even if you don't have an ID that you're going to be submitting, risk analysis is something very useful for your device development. So thinking it like mathematically, kind of, you would like to divide your whole risk into two parts. One, what is the risk associated with the device itself? What if device breaks? What if device bends? What if device um, give a wrong result? So what is the this, uh, risk associated with device? And then a separate part is what is the risk associated with the procedure that you need to utilize when using device? And then what is the frequency of those risks? Some things can be very risky, but chances of that happen can be one in a million. And the other things can be, you know, not so risky, but they can be uh, quite frequent. And you don't want to have situation of death of thousand needles. So once when you outline the risks, you outline the frequency or what you think frequency will be, or maybe experiments that you do to show the frequency of that needle banding, let's say. Then you can outline the steps that you're going to take to mitigate those risks in some way. And some, of course, we realize cannot be completely eliminated, but if you can mitigate them, how are you going to go about it? So that would be risk analysis. On our website, the link that was on the second slide, we have a template for risk analysis with some guidance, so you might find it helpful. Um, then we have description of device. That would go all the figures, drawings, description of your device, basically. Monitoring procedures that, again, Working in academic institutions, sometimes investigators uh, identify as uh, uh, just safety risks. But monitoring really procedure is monitoring not just for safety events, but in general 
has the study been conducted according to the protocol? Are informed consents collected as they're supposed to be? Are they properly signed? Uh, is the proper version of the protocol used? And all the risk associated with the study itself, not just safety risks. Um, any additional records or reports that you might have, you want to outline here. Uh, manufacturing information. Again, section that can be sometimes small, but uh, most of the time is, is, is actually quite a uh, quite big one and, and uh, takes some time to put everything together. Um, we see it, I kind of try to divide it into three parts depend, based on the complexity. We will have investigators that are using FDA approved device off label, or they start with FDA approved device and then they do some modifications, so it's not anymore FDA approved. So that will be, let's say, the most simple case scenario. Sometimes we have investigators that are using non-FDA approved device, but they're contracting the company or they are collaborating with the company that is making, making that, let's say, IVD. So they are not doing it. They're not making it themselves in the, in the lab, and they are not maybe even familiar with the way how is device manufactured. Uh, that's medium complexity. And the third one we have when device is non-FDA approved, and that's something that you are building in-house. And we have diagnostic devices like that um, for different type of in vitro diagnostic, actually. So how do you go about it? If device is approved, you're using it off-label, you can just refer to a label. FDA reviewed that manufacturing process when approving that device. If you're not making any modification, that should be just enough. If you're making modification, then you refer to the label and you describe which kind of changes you're making. How did you make those changes? What are the tests that you did to show that specifications are met or new specifications are met. So that it adds some complexity. And the third scenario, when someone else is making that device for you, would um, lead to this letter of authorization, which someone brought up as how do you refer to someone else's proprietary information. So if you are working with a company or another investigator that is making a device, and he or she or company allows you to refer to their manufacturing information or their previous human experience or any kind of testing that they did. In order for FDA reviewer to be allowed to go and look at those proprietary information, the company or a person need to send you a letter of authorization. That letter of authorization has to be sent to the FDA, to their documentation, as well as copy of letter needs to be sent to you. So letter of authorization is what you need to have to be allowed to refer to someone else's proprietary information. And this is what it says. It, can, it is from a sponsor or a company to their IDE. It can be their IND, and that we had sometimes for using the columns for cell therapy, for example, um, to their master file, if they had master file just for device um, manufacturing. Um, thus, the FDA reviewer will have a permission now to look someone else's proprietary information in, in relation to your study. And of course, copy of that letter, as I said, you need to include in your submission. Um, section six would be investigator's agreement. There is no form at the FDA uh, site, not yet developed form for investigator's agreement. So our group made, based on what investigator agreement really is, uh, and I can open those things, but based on what investigator agreement really is, we made like a template similar to 1572 form that we give to investigators, ask them to sign, and by signing that and checking box there and enclosing their CVs that basically comply with all those regulations. So you, what you want is as a sponsor, you don't want to allow anyone to be part of your study or any investigator to be part of your study. You don't want to ship your device or any results to another investigator that will be part of the trial before that investigator signs investigator's agreement. So you as a sponsor, you are ultim ultimately responsible what's going on in your study. So um, someone else this morning defined the, the, the sponsor. So if you look back in those slides, you will see who actually is sponsor and who is investigator. But basically as a sponsor, what you want from investigator is a CV, as well as statement that investigator has relevant experience, that um, it was, um, if it was involved in some type of investigation that was terminated uh, by the FDA, then it has to explain the circumstances. 
Um, financial disclosure information is not something that at this stage FDA needs to know, but you as a sponsor would prefer to have um, financial disclosure from investigators participating in your study. So there are known some negative surprises towards the end of, of your stat trial. Um, as well as investigators signing here the commitment basically that you're going to conduct investigation according to agreement, supervise all the testing, ensure that uh, informed consents are met. And you will see if you go to those regulations, there are a couple of more statements basically um, that investigators signs in order to be allowed to participate in a study. Once when you collect an investigator's agreement in your IDE, you can just, this is really just a sentence and it's present in our template already saying, yes, I will not allow anyone to start and be part of the investigation before signing investigator's agreement. So it's really just a statement. Um, you need to disclose RB information. Who will be the RBs that will re be reviewing your uh, protocol or your clinical study? Name and address of all investigators' institutions or sites that will be participating. Financial claims, which are different from financial disclosure, um, in, in some cases, maybe even majority of cases, when it comes to device study, we see situations when investigators are actually charging patients for participating in a study because um, insurance would not cover even FDA-approved device, to my knowledge, um, if it's used as a part of clinical study. So in this financial claim section, what you really are explaining is that you are charging in order to recuperate the costs and cover the cost of device, but you're not making any profit because you're not allowed to make a profit from clinical study, obviously. Environmental assessment is a section that still exists in CFR, but it's not really needed um, since last, I think, three, four years. So we just have a statement that it's not applicable, but we kept the script according to CFR. Uh, copies of all the labelings that you have, and it will be put on a device, um, including the statement that this is, I know by heart, but like uh, prohibited by federal law for investigational use only, because any device, even FDA approved, once when it's used in off-label manner, obviously as a part of clinical study, it's investigational device. Copies of informed consent, uh, they can be drafts. In your initial submission, you don't have to have them IRB approved. And speaking of that, you don't have to have your protocol IRB approved when you're submitting your ID initially. You just have to have a draft of it, and ultimately, both RB and FDA should have identical protocol and informed consent, but at this stage, you're basically getting feedback from FDA and from RB. And any additional information, if it's a pediatric population, if it um, involves any kind of radioactivity or any additional statements, import information, anything else, or export, anything else that you feel that FDA needs to know um, and you couldn't fit in any other area, can go as a part of additional information here. So we came back to, to, to the list that we started from. Again, if you go to this website, you will find actually a couple of templates, templates for IND. You will go find templates for risk assessment, template for investigators agreement, template from protocol based on ICA G6. So a couple of things that you might find it helpful. And ultimately, we'll find our telephone numbers. If you're coming from academia, feel free to give us a call. Uh, I know that uh, uh, David will speak a little bit more about how to, to really do a submission, so I kept this side ver slide very abbreviated, but basically this is current address of CDRH. That's where you should send it. Since 2012, I think September, um, in addition to paper copies, actually you are required to send electronic copies, which is different from ECTD submission. Uh, this is just electronic copy that is on CD or it can be on flash drive or um, DVD. Um, and most of the times they're identical copy to your paper copy, but it could be different. And we had a situation which an investigator wanted to include movie clip of uh, how device is really operating. It was robotic. So we wanted to have that as a part of e-copy, in, in which case you have to acknowledge in your uh, cover sheet or cover letter that paper copy is missing section so and so. Again, very good guidance on how to prepare e-copy so you don't get an e-copy hold or anything like that, which font you should use, which Adobe version, how to, uh, how to name them, because there is naming nomenclature that you need to follow. Um, this is a guidance that can very well, that, that very well spells out what you need to do to don't end up in this like technicality uh, issues. 
And what I've been asked to, because this was a very short uh, overview of how to put ID together, and it looks very simple, and sometimes it really is, sometimes it's much more involved, as we heard today. Um, what I wanted to say is that uh, initially we had a training program basically or mainly for uh, drugs and biologics, but with the recent need at Duke, we developed last two years a medical device training program that is, again, free of charge for anyone, and it can be uh, attended remotely via WebEx. We had people from NIH, we have even people from FDA and people from companies joining us, and um, we would love you to join, but also get the feedback if we can improve something. Um, and this is a link to our training program. It goes over uh, significant, non-significant risk assessment, what is abbreviated ID, how do you put ID together. What we have, actually, it's quite good uh, because we have over 500 submissions with the FDA. Our participants, after signing um, confidentiality agreement, are actually allowed to see real FDA submissions as well as correspondence that we got from the FDA, which can be useful to see which kind of level of details they requested and what kind of feedback we got. So if you're more interested in that, it lasts six weeks. You're joining via WebEx one hour per week, and then you do your homework by seeing and reviewing those applications um, remotely um, and confidentially, obviously. So if you're interested more in that, you can go to our website and contact um, the program coordinator and find out more about it. And based on the time, I'm happy to either take questions now or how would you advise or or uh, wait for a panel discussion okay <laughs>